Hey scholars, this week's module is on the ethics and N of 1 research. I'd like to acknowledge contributions to this module from Karen Douglas and Joel Levin. There are two main objectives in this module. One is to analyze threats to internal validity and two is to discuss ethical issues related to conducting applied research. Internal validity as a review from module two refers to the reliability of effect. It allows us to answer the question affirmatively, is the independent variable and only the independent variable responsible for the change in behavior? We can control threats to internal validity in order to enhance the believability of our findings. It's impossible to control for every threat and a possible threat might not actually end up being a threat. If you have your notes from module two, you may want to refer back to them. It may also be helpful to have a pencil and paper ready because I will display a graph and then see if you can name the threat to internal validity. Graph number one, name that threat. You can hit pause if you're still thinking, but I'll think aloud about this graph. What we see here potentially is the inhibitive effect of testing. At session 12, right here after session 11, um, data decrease and steadily increase. What might cause this drop? Could it be the inhibitive effect of testing? That might be a likely threat for graph number one. Try graph number two. can pause now if you're still thinking, but we have three tiers of participants and we see their baseline data displayed. Perhaps the test that we are repeatedly measuring their behavior on has some facilitative effect where they're learning from the test and that is contributing to the change in behavior. Additionally, it might be that something that Rachel is learning she is shared with Toby and shared with Heather because we see here at session three, her data look stable for Rachel, but Toby's data at session three begin and continue to accelerate. Likewise, we see Heather's data take a change at session three and begin to accelerate. Could be history, could be facilitative testing threats. Try graph three, name the threat. You can pause now if you're still thinking, what's going on with Alan's baseline data here? We see a high amount of variability. This is data instability. What would we do to control for this threat? Well, we'd want to keep on collecting baseline data until we found what the source of the instability was and perhaps could get a stable trend. Graph number four, name the threat. And pause here if you're still thinking, uh, what might be happening in this graph? We've got data in the A phase at a high level, decelerating in the B phase, further decelerating in B, C, and then stable and low in the B phase. What we see here in graph number four is a carryover effect. There's some threat where what's happening in the previous condition is contributing to a change in the next phase. Name the threat on graph number five. You can pause here if you're still thinking, but we do see some sequential effects. Could be the adaptation. Graph number six. Name the threat. You can pause here if you're still thinking. It helps to focus your attention on the abscissa or x-axis here where we see the days of the week labeled and we notice some patterns in behavior based on day of week. Perhaps this participant has a, a caregiver or neighbor dropping them off um, on certain days and not other days, and that might be contributing to the behavior that we're seeing. So we call this threat cyclical variability. 
Paragraph number seven. Name the threats. You can pause here if you're still thinking. Graph number seven. What we might notice in the table, the changes in who the instructor and who the data collector are, contribute to changes in what's happening with the data. So KA as instructor and data collector sees 0%, while CD is seeing 10%. The next time that CD is collecting data, we see 20%. But when KA is collecting data, we see 25%. Something's going on with a difference in the instructor and the data collector. The threat that might be at play here is instrumentation. The percentage agreement between these two um, independent observers is usually the strategy that we use for determining whether this threat to internal validity is present. We can avoid this problem by being sure that both the instructor and data collection collector are very clear on the operational definition of the behaviors of interest, um, and by validating and ensuring that we have a reliable instrument on which we're collecting data. Graph number eight, name the threat. What we see here also is instructor and data collector, um, some variance between the two. We may have a threat of procedural fidelity, meaning the steps that we're saying we're um, implementing as part of our intervention may be made up on the spot, altered on the spot, may not be showing procedural fidelity. Graph number nine, name the threat. And pause the video here if you're not ready. We've got a couple of things going on with graph number nine that pose a threat to internal validity. One is that our baseline data has an accelerating trend. We don't have stability here, so this would be data instability. Introduced the intervention, and we see an acceleration in the data path. It could be that there are some facilitative effects of testing could be adaptation. At least three potential threats to internal validity are visible on this graph, number nine. So let's recap. What is the goal of single subject research? Well, we want to establish a functional relation or make a causal inference that is valid and to do that, we need a control for threats to internal validity. When we do that, we can extend our external validity. So let's look a little bit deeper at what this means and what this looks like. Here's a withdrawal design. We've got Billy. In the A condition, the behavior, whatever this scale of 10 means, might be a frequency count, might be a um, duration, I just don't have enough information to call it, but his behavior is at a high level. When intervention B is introduced, the behavior drops to a lower level and is fairly stable. When we reintroduce A, we see an abrupt level change in the data path and we replicate the drop in level when we reintroduce B. So what we've got here are three demonstrations of effect. A to B, B to A, and A back to B. These three demonstrations of effect 
allow us to say that there's a functional relation. If we want to increase our external validity, we can perform this experiment again with the same subject, or we can extend to new participants, then replicate the effect with new participants. Here's a multiple baseline design. We've got Sally, Lisa, and Matt as our three tiers of participants. Remember, we need three demonstrations of effect at three points in time. Here, Sally's baseline data are low at 20 or below in the baseline phase. Upon introduction of the intervention, we see an abrupt level change and an acceleration in her data path. At the same point that we introduce the intervention, Lisa remains in baseline and her data continue to be stable and low. We see that same pattern happen with Matt. When we introduce the independent variable to Lisa, Matt's data stay low, but Lisa's data reflect a level change and acceleration in the direction likely of improvement. That effect is replicated again when we introduce the intervention for Matt and we see an abrupt level change. So here we have demonstration of effect one, demonstration of effect two, and demonstration of effect three. Three demonstrations of effect at three points in time give us a functional relation. What can we do to increase our external validity? Well, we could perform this experiment again with three different participants, ideally in a different setting ideally by a different research team. Um, our multiple probe design across word sets here. So this could be all Aiden's data, one participant across word sets. So we've got multiple probe across behaviors. What we notice happening here is for word set one, Aiden doesn't know the words. He doesn't know the words for word set two or word set three. When we begin our intervention, Aiden learns the words in word set one. He goes from zero to 100 with this intervention and he maintains that. But when we've intervened on word set one, word set two stays low. He hasn't learned the words in word set two. He hasn't learned the words in word set three. So this intervention is working for just this one set. We see stability in the other two sets that we haven't intervened on. When we do intervene on word set two, we see that Aiden maintains a high level for the ones he previously learned, and he maintains a low level for the words he has not learned with the new intervention yet. So what we have are one, two, three demonstrations of effect across word sets for this one participant. To strengthen our external validity, we might want to perform the experiment again with different behaviors, so new word sets, and or replicate with other participants. Remember our quality indicators that act as a guideline for creating and analyzing single subject research? NTACT offered a handy checklist of quality indicators. Rob Horner and colleagues gave us a checklist and narrative. Tom Cradwell and colleagues from the What Works Clearinghouse put some pilot standards together. All of these documents are useful for us to evaluate the methodological rigor of the single subject research intervention studies that we plan to carry out. Now, when we want to carry out applied research in a school setting, in a clinical setting, we need to do so with some thoughtful ethical considerations. We've got our, un our institutional review board at UWM. Their focus is to evaluate the cost benefit of conducting research. We have to acknowledge any risks that are at stake and minimize those risks while maximizing the benefit of the research. Often this entails obtaining informed consent and allowing participants to withdraw at any time. Um, in this class, we are going to batch protocol our IRB um, forms in order to secure the potential to carry out the proposal that you develop. So if you're in an applied setting and you're intervening 
on a behavior that is socially acceptable and of practical significance, you're likely intervening with some method, technique, procedure that you would use anyway to help that child achieve an IEP goal or an IFSP goal. Um, because you would be carrying out standard practice to intervene on a behavior that's of practical significance, we can go through an exempt IRB protocol. And what we may end up doing is getting permission um, from the parents or getting consent, getting assent from the participant to disseminate confidential data from business as, as usual practice. So it's a fairly quick and simple IRB process that we'll do as a unit in this class. Um, and I just want to highlight that we're going to do this with ethics and integrity. So IRB's focus is to evaluate the cost benefit. What is the benefit of disseminating effects of business as, as usual intervention? Um, data need to be confidential. The identity of the participant has to be obscured. So we don't want to name any actual names or any actual um, schools or places that might disambiguate identity. In carrying out our single subject research, we'll collect inner observer and inner rater reliability. We'll evaluate and collect procedural reliability data. We'll be honest if the intervention or independent variable isn't effective then single subject design is so flexible and so forgiving and is the scientific method, we can change it. That's the beauty of this design. When something's not working, we can change it and document a phase change. We'll keep our data and study information confidential and in a secure place. A couple other ethical issues that might come up. If our design um, allows us to embed some randomization, will accept that there are no do-overs in randomization. We set a priori decisions and rules, and we have our scoring and response protocols that we can maybe even do some blind or masked review to keep us honest in our data collection and reporting. So in summary, we'll be ethical and have integrity.